Please welcome Jonah Goldberg to Washington University School of Law. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I got to tell you one thing that the guys in the overflow room, which is a rarity for me, uh, uh, they have better air conditioning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so uh, just so you know up front, uh, the, a couple things about the introductory remarks. First of all, uh, three New York Times bestsellers. Uh, <laughs> second of all, um, it left out the high watermark of my entire professional career, which was that when the LA Times picked me up as a columnist, Barbara Streisand canceled her subscription and protest. <laughs> um, and, uh, Three, when I agreed to do this a long time ago, it hadn't occurred to me that this was Yom Kippur. And so even though I am a really bad Jew, um, I shouldn't be doing this. But um, if it helps, and I'm pretty sure it does help with my people, I will feel really guilty about it. <laughs> um, so in anticipation of, of sweating very soon, I'm just going to take off my jacket now. And, uh, I'm, I'm descended from a desert people, but we like a dry heat. Um, so anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, I, I understand the heart out at 6.30. If, you know, if the Hebrews want to flee like it's Egypt, I won't take offense. Um, um, but regardless, I'll do my best. Uh, as, as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I won't keep you long. Um, So many of you, uh, well, I don't know about many of you, but some of you may remember a uh, pro wrestler from the 1980s and 1990s uh, named uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. And uh, believe me, I'm, I'm getting to democracy. And uh, uh, he died around the time I was working on this book. And for those of you who don't remember, he was in a movie called They Live, which I recently wrote about for the magazine. Um, they Live is a, one of John Carpenter's classic sort of B-movie, science fiction movie, uh, uh, adventure movie, where he, uh, the most famous line that Rowdy Roddy Piper has in it is, I came here today to uh, kick ass and chew gum, and I'm all out of gum. Right? <laughs> and that's what I thought the movie was most famous for for most of my, um, uh, most of my life. You know, I mean, it wasn't the major issue in my life, but it was, you know, to the extent I thought about the movie, having watched it so many times, like sort of hung over on a Sunday afternoon, and I really liked it. Um, that's about as big as it got into my head. And then I discovered that, in fact, um, They Live is considered by many of the world's leading Marxist intellectuals to be the greatest single Marxist film ever made. And I, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Um, uh, I'll give you an example in here. Or maybe I won't. Um, it's a cult favorite among uh, Frankfurt School Marxists. It's been written about, and there's a book about it, how it's the greatest Marxist movie ever made. And to understand um, why that's interesting to me, uh, I'll tell you quickly about the story about it. So in the story, Roddy Roddy Piper plays this sort of bourgeois everyman. He's a hardworking guy, good values, but he's down on his luck. It's sort of like a Great Depression period. And uh, he's just trying to make it and get an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. And one day he finds some sunglasses on the ground and he puts them on and all of a sudden he sees that the world that we all take for granted is sort of a mirage, sort of a Potemkin village and that there's a, there's a deeper truth beneath the facade of everyday life. And so when he puts on the glasses, the colorized world becomes black and white. And when he sees like uh, billboards with a beautiful woman in a bikini where it says come to the Bahamas or something like that, underneath it says marry and reproduce. Right? That advertising is full of stuff that says obey and conform and all of these things. And this is essential to a lot of Marxist arguments so that basically capitalism creates, takes wants and makes people think their needs and it, it, conform, it sort of channels us into conformity and all the rest. I wrote about all that in the magazine. I'm not going to get into the weeds on it. But what I wanted to do for this book was come up with some literary equivalent of those glasses. 
because one of my obsessions in the last few years these days um, is to try and look at the world, the modern world, the contemporary world, and see the things or the institutions or the norms that someone from, say, 500 years ago would see. Security? Sorry, this phone is ringing. Um, and see, someone from 500 years ago would see and say, oh, that's more continuity than it is change. And I'll give you an example. Um, all right, so one example would be North Korea, right? North Korea, people, we still talk about it as this Marxist, Stalinist, communist dictatorship, but they've purged from all of their public documents, all of their public propaganda, all of their official you know, charters and whatnot, almost all Marxist gar jargon has been gone for decades. It's, it's not a Marxist country. It's, it's something much older. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a monarchy. Um, it's gone from, the, it's not the divine right of kings, but it's the divine right of kims. Um, if you read the official state propaganda, the grandfather, Kim Jong-il, um, uh, was literally, well, not literally, uh, but according to them, literally, um, born in the Mount Korean, North Korean mountains, and when he was born, night turned to day, rainbows appeared, I don't know, unicorns danced, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, Kim Jong-un's dad, uh, I don't know if you know this, but is supposed to be, um, his body was supposed to be so unbelievably efficient that he'd never used the bathroom. And if you look at, if you do a Google image search of his dad, he doesn't look like he's got the world's most efficient body. He also <laughs> was the author of, according to the North Korean state, the author of um, something like 18 of the uh, of the world's greatest symphonies. This is something that all every society agrees upon. And he wrote like four, 400 books while in college. And so in other words, it's a cult. But it's not just a cult of, of, of personality. It's also very something very familiar to people um, from medieval Europe or medieval China. Uh, it's, they have surfed them there. They have 50 different classes and castes where people who are descendants of of the, suppose, the collaborationists are basically only allowed to do menial work. They're like untouchables in, in, in feudal India. Um, they've created a system that is sort of natural to the human mind, um, that is very old fashioned, very old. It's not modern totalitarian. It's a kind of classical, almost religious authoritarianism that somehow f works for them. I'll give you another example. Uh, one of my favorite examples is um, in some states in Mexico, uh, teaching jobs, according to the Mexican teachers' unions, are heritable. So if you teach chemistry, you leave your chemistry teaching job to your son or daughter, regardless of whether or not they can teach chemistry. And um, this is a very old style of guild economics. It was common in Europe. It was common in Asia. Um, and it lives on today. So anyway, I, I, I look for these things all over the place, and, um, but I couldn't come up with something like the, the sunglasses, so I had to use a more sort of cliched thing. And uh, I used the visitor from outer space. And, uh, and I got this sort of thought experiment from a guy at Yale, Josh Green, who wrote a great book called Moral Tribes, and where he says, basically, imagine you're an alien from another planet who's been tasked with the job of monitoring human progress, um, homo sapien progress. And, um, and so let's say for the sake of argument that we split off from the Neanderthals about 250,000 years ago. There's a debate about it, but that's sort of a consensus mid-range number. Um, and so the alien, he is to come to Earth and see how these new homo sapiens are managing, right? But he can only visit once every 10,000 years. So on his first visit, he shows up. And he looks at the Homo sapiens, and he writes in his little notebook, semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. Comes back in 10,000 years. Semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. No change. Comes back in 10,000 years. Semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. No change, right? I mean, there'd be some changes. Migration would change. It means some diet would change and all that kind of stuff. At some point, someone passes the Bering, crosses the Bering Sea or whatever. But for the most part, he would do this 23 times and write the same thing in his book. On the 24th time, 
he would see unbelievable changes. First tools and metallurgy come out, some really lovely pots and earthenware. Um, the first city-states, uh, huge changes in, in social organization and, and diet because of the rise of agriculture, which brings about things like slavery for the first time. Um, and so you'd be just amazed, you know, and look at the, they have, they have their wars and buildings and all this. So you would say, okay, I can't wait to see what happens when I come back in 10,000 years. So in 10,000 years he comes back and before he even gets here, his spaceship is picked up by NORAD. Um, and he might get here just in time to see, I don't know, like Miley Cyrus twerking at the Super Bowl, right? So the point of this is to say that um, almost everything that we associate with progress, material progress, economic progress, social progress, has happened in the last 10,000 years. The problem with that is that's really misleading. That's like me saying that the combined net worth of me and Jeff Bezos is about $70 billion, right? <laughs> I mean, it's accurate, but it leaves a little bit out, right? And um, uh, because almost all of that progress has taken, taken place in the last 300 or so years, in the space of six lifetimes. Um, there is an overwhelming consensus among economic historians, anthropologists, sociologists, that, I mean, there may be some arguments at the edges about the numbers, but the basic gist is, is that for 250,000 years, the average human being everywhere in the world, ancient Rome, ancient China, ancient Greece, South America, North America, you name it, the average human being everywhere lived on about $3 per day. And that changed once and only once in all of human history, and in one place, in England. Now, there is an argument that it also might have changed first in Holland, and if there are any Dutch jingoists in the room, we can have that argument later. Um, but you, know, like, you, you might recall, you know, there's that big debate about the hockey stick and global warming, about you know, carbon emissions or carbon concentrations in the atmosphere, and they're like this, and the Industrial Revolution comes and it goes like that. It's an interesting graph, you've got arguments about whether it's real or not, and all that kind of stuff. A far more interesting one is the hockey stick that says that for 250,000 years, never mind what our you know, pre-homo sapien ancestors lived like, for 250,000 years, the natural state of humanity was a condition of grinding poverty, punctuated by an early death, usually from violence or some bowel stewing disease. And then once, and only once, it starts to go like this, and go like this. And it goes out further and further and further as, it as, these, the, the, as this phenomenon spreads around the world. And it happened only one time in one place. Now, there are a bunch of conclusions that one can draw from this. Well, first of all, I should just point out, it's still going on. This moment is the greatest moment of poverty alleviation in all of human history, by far. In the last 30 years, billions of people have been lifted out of poverty and extreme poverty. Um, the UN is now thinking about getting rid of the designation extreme poverty in the next decade or two because of these changes. And it didn't happen because of the UN. Right? Um, I'm not saying the UN does bad things. There are a lot of good things that the UN does. There are, you know, my wife works for Nikki Haley, um, and it's not awkward at all that my wife works for the Trump administration. Um, uh, she hates that joke. And, uh, the UN does some good things, but it didn't do this. What did this was this thing I call the miracle. Now, I call it a miracle for a bunch of different reasons, right? It's this thing that emerges, that appears 300 years or so ago in England, Scotland, spreads out, right? Um, I call it a miracle for a bunch of different reasons. First of all, because it's just freaking miraculous, right, that you have this unbelievable transformation of the environment that humanity lives in for the first time in human history. Um, where uh, you know, lifespans go up, literacy goes up, poverty goes down, bigotry goes down, all of these amazing things happen like this. And they've been going like this ever since. And, but the main reason I call it miraculous isn't because God gave it to us, though I'm totally open to that argument, one of the things, I, but one of the things I'm trying to do in my book is reach out to people who are not persuaded by arguments about, well, God says so, 
right? If you already believe God says so, I don't need to persuade you. And if you don't believe that God says so, then me saying God says so has no effect on you. So what I do is I actually try to argue on, you know, I don't have to call it the lefts, but on sort of modern secular terms. These are the things that the mo a modern secular person thinks government should fix. Health, poverty, um, you know, bigotry, all of these sorts of things. And part of my argument is that the miracle is the thing that does that. Um, but the main reason I call it a miracle is that we just don't know why it happened. There are lots of theories about why it happened. I certainly have my own views about why it happened. But there's no consensus on it. There's a consensus about the poverty point. There's no consensus about you know, the hockey stick blade, about why it happened. The Marxists have one story. Fans of Max Weber have another story. And um, I personally don't think it matters that much to come up with an explanation. As, we say, as she was saying in the introduction, part of the thing is that we just we need to be grateful for it in the first place, right? Um, if a goose that lays a golden egg comes into your life, you're supposed to be grateful for it, right? The way they teach the story of the goose that lays the golden egg, it's always about greed. But and then fine, there's greed in it. That's not a particularly interesting parable. The more important moral of the story is it's about ingratitude. The two main versions of the story that come to us um, through France and England, one in the 14th century and one in the 15th century, in one version, it's this couple, they get a goose, they find a goose that squeezes out a golden egg every single day, and let me tell you, if you, if you adjust for $1,400, a golden egg is really valuable, right? And the goose comes in, gives them a golden egg every day, but they use their reason to conclude, ah, well, if it's giving us one golden egg a, a day, it must have a giant lump of gold inside. Let's cut it open, <laughs> right? And they cut it open, there's no, there's no gold in there, and they're out of a pretty nice source of revenue. Um, the other version, the English version, uh, the goose comes up to this farmer and starts giving him golden eggs. After a while, the farmer says, you know, you should, you should double your quota and give me two golden eggs a day. And the goose politely says, I'm sorry, sir, I can't do that. And he goes into a blinding rage and kills the goose, right? So my interpretation of both versions of this is that it's not so much greed, it's ingratitude. And these two approaches, right, the sort of hyper-rational, I'm smarter than the goose, I'm smarter than the market, right, I'm smarter <coughs> than the system, um, is the sort of classic technocratic progressive way of thinking about capitalism. It's basically the guy who, who the, the couple, they're basically the Paul Krugman version <laughs> of the story. You know, I'm smarter than everybody. I can think better than the market. I am, you know, um, you should just all shut up and listen to me. And then there's the sort of rage-fueled version, which is very much the populist version, which we have versions of from Bernie Sanders to know, Steve Bannon, right? And um, and both of them, I believe, are a sort of a threat to this unbelievably wonderful thing that we've got. And, but there's another lesson from my sort of uh, alien, visiting alien example. If the lesson, if, if and it's simply this, it's, a, it's simply a way to think about it. If this version of history which basically is confirmed by every academic source you want to have. I mean, there are going to be disagreements at the margins. Um, is true. That means that democracy is unnatural. It means that capitalism is unnatural. Property rights are unnatural. I'm not talking about in terms of natural law theory. I'm talking about in terms of what actually manifests itself in the evolutionary record. If we were intended to have capitalism, it would have showed up and have been a stable form of government a little earlier than 300 years ago. If you take a jar of ants and you dump them out on the ground on some faraway planet that has an Earth-like atmosphere, the ants will immediately start doing ant stuff. Digging holes and tunnels and anointing a queen. I don't know what ants do, but they'll do ant stuff, right? Um, if you could take a bunch of humans bereft of any education, right, 
and dump them out, wipe, their, wipe them clean to their basic programming, and you put them on a similar planet. Push my red button. Uh, if you put them on some planet and dump them there, they will not all of, all, all of a sudden get together and come up with a really cool new iPhone app, right? They will make spears and use rocks and turn into a band of semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. And so this gets to a really important lesson um, that I've been trying to spread for a very long time now. One of the best definitions of conservatism is simply the idea that human nature has no history. Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite intellectuals, she used to say, every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. <laughs> Anybody who's had kids knows that when they come into this world, first of all, they are barbarians, but second of all, they come into this world with a lot of preloaded software in them, right? They are not blank slates, but they also, we also know they need updates, right? And that's what the family does first, more than any other institution, is it takes these barbarians and turns them into proto-citizens. If you took, if you had a time machine, you could clean up in the stock market, but that's not important right now. If you had a time machine and you took a baby from, I don't know, New Rochelle, right, and you sent it back a thousand years to a Viking village, it would, and it got adopted, it would grow up to rape and pillage the English countryside. If you took a Viking village, from a, a Viking baby from a thousand years ago, and you brought it to New Rochelle, it grew up to be an orthodontist. <laughs> there's nothing in all babies start with the same software and there's and it's fascinating to me um, how anybody could have ever thought that we were born blank slates we're not there is a thing called human nature there's a guy Paul Bloom at Yale a uh, really great guy a uh, uh, famous uh, psychologist who does this has this amazing book called Just Babies where they do experiments to see what kind of preloaded software the babies come into this world with. And it's astounding how much they have. They have a moral sense. They have a sense of who are, you know, we're talking about, and first of all, let me be very clear, no babies were harmed in the conducting of these experiments. Uh, um, but you know, babies, almost, almost from birth, babies cry in accents. French babies have a French accent cry. German babies have a German accent cry. It's very authoritarian. Um, uh, uh, babies, are t babies have this uh, instinctual thing about bonding with people who look like their parents, and they think those are friend or family, and that people who look very different are strangers and therefore scary. Um, which gets to a really important point, People say, you know, there's one of these cliches that goes around that says, you know, you have to be taught to hate. Children have to be taught to hate. This is not true. Children have to be taught not to hate, right? We come preloaded with the ability to hate. One of the strongest impulses we have, read Jonathan Haidt on this stuff, one of the strongest impulses we have is dividing the world between us and them. That is our tribal mindset. And so I'm fast forwarding, as you can tell, I'm not really consulting my notes very much on here. Um, uh, but let's talk about that tribalism for a second. Because if human nature has no history, if we are all born like barbarians and have to be turned into citizens, then Ronald Reagan was right when he said that every generation, uh, that, that, that tyranny is, no more than, is never more than one generation away because we're not, born, we're not born with democracy in our blood. It has to be fought for. And so part of my argument is that um, civilization in and of itself is unnatural. It is, you know, it, is, it, is, it is manufactured because our natural environment is very different than St. Louis on a, on a Tuesday night, right? This is one of the reasons why I love TV shows like, and movies like The Walking Dead. 
because the second there's, or like the Mad Max movies, the second there's some sort of catastrophe and faith in government goes away, we immediately revert into warring bands and tribes um, the way our programming says we're supposed to be. And so this is a big theme of my book because part of my argument is that we don't understand what, it, what corruption means anymore. If you read the Bible, if you read Shakespeare, if you read Chaucer, you have more time for reading than I do. But uh, if you read these things, you will find that the, the, the Oxford English Dictionary, corruption used to mean it used to be more than just simply graft or bribery, right? It is, that's fine. I mean, that's a perfectly fine everyday use for the term. But the meaning of it used to be so much, almost central to our lives. Corruption was entropy, decay. It was like the second, thaw, second law of thermodynamics. It basically, it's the whole idea that's bound up in ashes to ashes and dust to dust, right? It's this, it's this idea that says, Nature will always reclaim what is hers. The Greek, the Roman poet Horace used to say, um, or at least he wrote once, I don't know how often he said it. Uh, he said, you can chase nature out with a pitchfork. It will always come running back, in, rushing back in. Right? It's this idea that rust never sleeps. Uh, if you've ever had, if you ever owned a boat or known anyone who's owned a boat or basically anything particularly expensive that's made of wood, um, you'll discover very quickly how if you don't ma maintain them, if you don't maintain and, 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 and keep them up, they'll revert back to, nature will reclaim them through you know, rust or rot very, very quickly. Nature does not care. Termites don't care whether you have a gr beautiful grandfather clock or an outhouse. They'll eat them both just the same, right? And... That's the story of Lord of the Flies, these pinnacles of Western civilization. They're dropped off on an island. Five minutes later, they're worshiping you know, a demon head um, uh, and running around with spears and war paint because they lose the veneer of civilization. They revert back to them to their true selves. And so corruption should be understood not just in terms of wounds being infected or termites reclaiming things or any of that or decay or the second law of thermodynamics should also be understood in terms of human nature. When we give in to human nature, it is a form of corruption. When we give in to the wrong kinds of human, because there are a lot of positive things to human nature too. I'm not saying that we're just horrible and we all need to be Vulcans. Um, but there's, we understand this so completely when, when people, when um, young people, when people commit horrible acts of violence, they're reverting back to barbarism, right? We, uh, we understand intuitively that we're going backwards out of civilization. Part of my argument is, is that we don't appreciate this anymore. In the last, pick your time frame, I, I think it all starts with romanticism and that romanticism never ended. Um, but because we are very well conditioned from a very young age to get incredibly bored when someone starts talking about romanticism. I will stop talking about romanticism. Um, but we live in a romantic era where we now tell people, especially kids, the only true authentic authenticity, the only true truth is truth to yourself. Listen to your gut, listen to your own code, right? There are heroes in almost every pop culture flick. I start collecting these examples of it. There are hundreds of these examples where you have guys who do unbelievably terrible things in movies and TV shows, and they defend it on the grounds that, he, well, he's living by his own code, right? A man's got to have a code. So, you know, as long as it's your code to, like, go out and cut people's heads off with a machete, you know, at least you're staying true to yourself, you know? Um, and... Uh, this impulse to say to listen to your own instincts, to listen to your inner voice and not pay attention you know, to anybody outside of yourself, any rules outside of yourself. Sean Hannity has a sound bite at the beginning of his radio show I heard the other day. He says, you can't live your life worrying about what other people think about you, which could be the intro to Hannibal Lecter's radio show, right? <laughs> um, Part of, part of my argument in the book, people give me a lot of time for, for dissing God in the book, even though God, spoiler alert, kind of sneaks back in at the end. One of the great problems that we have um, in the last 
hundred years, or what, a lot of the problems that we have in the last hundred years from modernity stem from the fact that we've lost the concept of being God-fearing, right? Because if, if it's kind of a Hallmark card thing, but if, if character is the thing you do when nobody else is watching, when you're worried that God is always watching you, um, you tend to be more likely to be on the straight and narrow. That is some, one of these things that's sort of lost in our culture these days, for large parts of our culture. Instead, we celebrate self-expression over self-discipline. You, know, you have people who think that as long as you get enough clicks or YouTube views while making an astounding ass of yourself, um, it's all worthwhile because if the, only real, uh, if the only real North Star is being true to yourself and being popular or whatever in self-expression, then there's no problem with it. So I'll talk very briefly about politics now for a second, and then I do want to get to the Q&A. Um, this corruption manifests itself in all sorts of ways, and it comes from a very specific place. I argue because of the loss of God-fearingness, because of the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of civil society. These institutions that turn barbarians into citizens aren't doing their jobs. And I think it starts with the family. Talk to any teacher Whenever you give them a hard time about you know, kids in school today, they'll, they'll give you it right back in your face about how it starts with the family. They got a point. And so when family breaks down, all the other institutions have a harder time. And, um, and so what happens is we don't civilize people properly, so instead they fall back on their wiring, their tribal wiring. We have these other structural problems, things like social media and Facebook, right? I mean, Facebook in particular is basically an envy machine where people curate their lives to make it seem like they're having so much more fun than everybody else. Um, I have a 15-year-old daughter, right? And I watch how, you know, it used to be if you weren't, and I'm a, my daughter's fine, eh, she's sick right now, but, um, uh, but you, you, know, you talk to other parents about their kids, and it used to be, when I went to school, if you didn't get invited to the party, you, at least you didn't hear about it till Monday. Now it's live tweeted about the thing you're not invited to, right? And it's kind of brutal. But we have this tendency now, because civil society is breaking down, to retreat to virtual communities as if they're a substitute for real communities. And virtual communities aren't real communities. Facebook is fine for staying in touch with old friends. But for the most part, and there are some exceptions, these things are not really good at making real friends. Friends who will come to your house in the middle of the night if you have a crisis. You know, friends who will give you a hug. Friends who will take care of you. Friends who know you. We are, we are one of our subroutines is that we're only, there's a thing called Dunbar's number. We're only supposed to really know about 150 to 200 people. Almost everybody else is an abstraction. And so one of the things that we get these days is people retreat from civil society. They retreat from actually engaging with real human beings. And instead, they start watching politics like it's a spectator sport. Now, there's amazing social science. Again, I refer you to some of Bloom's work. He has another great book called Against Empathy. There's amazing social science about what happens when we start watching things as if it's entertainment. First of all, our civilizational moral code goes out the window. I can list all sorts of these movies and TV shows where a man's got to have, to, got to have a code where if someone behaved like that in the real world, I think they should go to jail. But when I'm seeing them in the movie, I'm cheering them on. We let heroes torture people. We let heroes indiscriminately kill people. Um, and we don't care. There's one study that had, and I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but there's a study that had um, uh, people watch uh, fake, they didn't know it was fake, watching people get uh, electrocuted or tortured, right? Badly shocked. And when they didn't know anything about the subject, the pain centers of their brains lit up. They had this empathetic connection with the person being tortured. They were then told that person is a fan of the sports team you hate the most. And then all of a sudden, the pleasure centers of their brain start going off, right? So when you start watching things as if they're entertainment, you no longer really care about constructive rules about a free society, you start seeing it as a zero-sum battle of winners versus losers. And that's how we are increasingly watching politics now. Because we retreat to things like Facebook, we retreat to our own little 
silo of news where we watch, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC or CNN um, uh, or whatever news feed you have, we tend to gravitate towards the news sources that will tell us the information that we want to hear, that will enforce our biases rather than question them. We tend to want to be friends with people who will already agree with us. And so you get this cascading effect of confirmation bias and groupthink that is taking over things. And so now, and this is a huge problem, it's been a problem on the left for a very long time, it's now a huge problem on the right too, um, where people are, who think things are justifiable solely if it makes the other side sad. Um, that, and the problem with this is that when you start saying ends justify the means, the means end up becoming ends unto themselves. So something, you know, it's one thing to make liberals cry because you beat them in an argument and you won the day on an, in a debate over minimum wage. It's another thing to say, it's just good to make liberals cry. That just means you're an asshole. <laughs> and I've been trying to say this to college kids for 20 years now that by all means challenge political correctness, by all means be controversial, but have a point to it. If you're just going around thinking that because being an ass is politically incorrect, it's okay to be an ass, then you're just looking for an excuse to be an ass, because you are one. And, but this dynamic is true across our politics these days. My wife once got, my favorite New Yorker cartoon has two dogs sitting in a bar and both in suits, and one dog drinking martinis says to the other dog, you know, it's good that dogs succeed, but cats must also fail. <laughs> That's basically our politics these days in a nutshell, right? And so what I'm trying to do is break out of that a little bit. It's amazing to see how angry this makes some people on the right who want me to play a role that they ascribed to me a long time ago, and how angry it makes people on the left who want me to play a role that they've ascribed to me, I think, unfairly a long time ago. And when in reality, I just think things are a mess on both sides, and I don't want to be part of it. And so I'll just close with this last point. The greatest thing that the Founding Fathers ever did, other than you know, create this country and all that, um, I, let me just put it this way, one of the greatest things they did was get rid of inherited titles of nobility. We never really talk about that, right? It's not one of these things that's essential to what we teach about the founding or the constitution or checks and balances. But that was unbelievably radical because for the previous 10,000 years, it was just normal to assert that some people were better than other people by accident of birth. I wish the founders had worked through that logic when it came to slavery from the beginning. And, um, but that's a subject we can talk about in Q&A if you want, that just gets us too deep in the weeds for now. But it is a natural human nature to divide the world up into us and them. There's never been a society in all of human history where um, people didn't give preferences to family and friends. That is natural. The Catholic Church struggled to kill nepotism for 2,000 years. We get the word nepotism from nepotismo, which means nephewism in Italian, right? The Chinese and the Turks, they came up with really interesting ways to deal with nepotism. They created a, 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 a guild of slave bureaucrats and they castrated them because they figured, oh, if we take care of them that way, then you know, they won't have any kids. Turned out not to work. Over time, what's called the coalition instinct built in and they started forming a sort of a praetorian guild about themselves, helping themselves, serving themselves. When you look across the United States today, from the problems of crony capitalism to identity politics to populism, the, the, this idea that my group deserves special rules and special treatment, while your group deserves to be held to the strictest standards possible, is running rampant all over the place. You can see it in this Kavanaugh craziness. You can see it anywhere you look. And it is so contrary to what this country was founded on. Imperfectly at first, this idea has been improving over time and been more fully realized over time. But this basic idea that you're supposed to take people as you find them and that the rules should be the same for everybody. Normally, when I talk, give this talk, I talk about the Lockean Revolution, this idea that our rights come from God, not from government. We are citizens, not subjects. 
that the fruits of our labors belong to us, that the government works for us, we don't work for it. These ideas are what created the miracle. And what we do today is that we don't teach people to be grateful for them. We don't teach people to appreciate them. We teach the opposite. We teach resentment and entitlement. We teach people to take the worst aspects of our history and hold them up as ex exemplars of what we really are, rather than holding up the worst aspects of our history and saying, look how we defeated this thing. The interesting thing about America isn't that we had slavery, but that we got rid of it. Because slavery exists in virtually every civilization over the last 10,000 years. And we got rid of it because we reached for an ideal that was better than our worst aspects of our nature. We're not doing that anymore. We are teaching people that our nature is the ultimate authority. And that's why I called the book Suicide of the West, not Death of the West or End of the West, because that's a choice. We as a civilization are choosing to do this, to look away from our inheritance, to, to imbue our kids with a lack of gratitude, and that's a suicidal choice. And Ronald Reagan was right when he said, we're never more than one generation from tyranny. And that means that all of us have a responsibility to fight barbarism from the left, from the right, from wherever. Because when you're at the top of the mountain, it doesn't matter, left and right don't mean that much anymore. You can go left towards socialism or right towards nationalism, but when you're at the top, whichever way you go, you're still going down. And it's incumbent upon all of us to reject that direction. Thank you all very much. Yeah, look, uh, I have a lot of regrets about the Iraq war. And I've written more than once that it was a mistake. And um, I don't think it was the mistake that um, a lot of the opponents at the time, not all, some made very good arguments that seem prescient now, but it wasn't a war for oil, it wasn't all of that kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was an honorable and understanding, an understandable misinterpretation of events. I think that the great intelligence failure of the Iraq war um, wasn't that there were no WMDs, because I always thought that was sort of just one of many reasons for the war. It was the complete and total bankruptcy of analysis about what to do after we won the war. And, uh, and that was an abject failure of the Bush administration. It was an abject failure of a lot of our elites um, from both political parties. Um, and of course, I regret the loss of even a single American life. Um, so I've, you know, you bring up a column I wrote, check my math, 15 years ago. Uh, I've revisited a lot of things and ways, a lot of positions and ways of thinking about things since then um, because that's what growing up tends to do to people. So, Yes, um, so I, I, I talk about this at some length. Um, Joseph Schumpeter is one of my favorite economists. Um, he argued that we were destined for socialism because the problem with the, with the relentless rationality and efficiency of the market is that it first destroys a lot of bad customs and traditions, but like water, water seeking its own level, um, it will go through good traditions and customs as well. And um, I think he overstated how in, inimicable the market is to uh, the family, uh, but it's a real problem when we start bringing, I mean, one way to think about it, in the family, we are all communists, you know? Um, it literally is from each according to our ability to each according to their need. I do not, you know, if you have two sons and one's kind of dim-witted, you don't give him, the, you know, worse food than the other one, right? Um, you don't send him to the worst doctor, right? Um, uh, I don't charge my daughter rent. I don't put price tags on the food in the fridge. Uh, we're, we're a collective that is prior to the market. And when you start applying the logic of the market, the re relentlessly uh, anti-authoritarian sort of easiest path logic of the market to things like the family, you destroy them. Um, 
I think that the, the commodification of so much of our lives is a bigger problem, though. Uh, you know, families can exist within a market system pretty well so long as the larger religious ethic, uh, ethical constructs are there. But capitalism also rewards provocateurs. It rewards people who question authority or in question um, uh, and, and try to get rid of every inconvenience in life, in life. And that makes sort of instilling good values in kids harder and harder. So it's a constant tension which requires more vigilance because, you know, look, socialism ain't great for the family either. Look, this is a very complicated time to talk about trade um, because the President of the United States cares more about trade than any previous president in our lifetime, and he doesn't understand what a trade deficit is. Um, and so it makes things kind of complicated when you try to talk to people who actually think he is the world's greatest negotiator. Um, uh, I try to look, I mean, there is a political point that it's, it's very frustrating. When you, when, you, when you have arguments with people like my friend Larry Kudlow, right, about the tariffs and protectionism, and you say, look what we're doing about China and, and these tariffs, or look at what we're doing with Canada. They'll switch it to China, and then they'll switch it to intellectual property theft. Well, that's a problem. That's a legitimate problem. And if we could put pressure on them to get them to fix that, that's great. The idea that Canada is a national security threat because of the price supports it puts on milk is crazy talk, right? And, and so I, I think part of the problem is, is that people are confusing economics with the, poli the, the politics of theater or the theatricality of Trump's politics. And so when I try to talk about trade with people, I just try to start from the basics, which is the idea that in a state of nature, um, the, the way, if you have a barrel of apples and I want your apples, the way I get your apples, I hit you over the head with a rock and I take your apples. In a market economy, you want money, I want apples. You get money, I get apples, it's win-win. Um, in terms of like macro trade stuff, I just think that I mean, it, it's very hard. It's very hard to come up with a serious argument against some of this tariff stuff because it is so wrapped up in the cult of personality about Donald Trump, and um, I don't think there is a really great defense for it. So it really kind of depends on the narrow question at hand. And I would rather teach people that trade in and of itself is a good, uh, good thing, and then they can sort of come to the politics part. But Donald Trump, he goes back and forth from between saying. Tariffs are great, we're getting rich because of tariffs, but my goal is uh, total free trade with zero tariffs. Well, why? If we're making money with tariffs and tariffs are great, why do you want zero, zero tariffs and free trade? I thought free, either free trade is a good thing to pursue or it's not, and he and his defenders want to have it both ways, and so I guess I just try to point out the logical inconsistencies and then I start cutting myself again. <laughs> Populism, which according to the textbook definition, just basically means peopleism, right? It's just that the, the, the people should have their way. Uh, that's where we get like vox populi and whatnot. I'm a big believer that all poisons are determined by the dose. So a little populism is fine, right? A little sort of, you know, William F. Buckley, who famously said I'd rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston phone book than the faculty at Harvard, was, you know, there's a, there's a little populism there, to be sure, but he was by no means not an elitist. The guy played the harpsichord and summered in Stad, right? <laughs> um, uh, my problem with populism, as it actually operates historically, the only populist movement I ever endorsed was the Tea Party movement, because it was the kind of populism that I thought the libertarians had, libertarian prophets had long been calling for, where the people will rise up throw the bums out and then take over the government and then leave everybody alone, right? Um, but historically, populism basically is the logic of the mob. It's the logic of the crowd. It is the logic that says um, all of us are right and our anger is self-justifying. It's inherent, first of all, it's inherently anti-intellectual. Uh, William Jennings Bryan had this great line where he said, the people of Nebraska are for free silver, therefore I am for free silver, I will look up the arguments later. <laughs> um, if you look at the populist movements in American history, they're very much this, they're very much, or in European history, 
They're very much part of the cult of unity that just says the crowd is right, that the, my, my people are right, and because we're angry, we should have our way. And the founding fathers, who were very much in favor of some democracy, were not all in on dem democracy because uh, they understood, you know, read Federalist 10, Federalist 51, they understood that the worst despotisms could be the despotism of the majority. And what they want, particularly an angry majority, right? And so uh, they set up a system where cooler heads would prevail, where populist anger would have to be, could be channel, channeled through the House, but then it's cooled off in the Senate so that you could actually deliberate on things. And one of the problems that we have in our society today is that we've had this breakdown in institutions that used to filter populist rage. Um, breakdown of the, main, the institutions of the mainstream media. We are more partisan than we've ever been, arguably, but the parties themselves are weaker than they've ever been. And so there are very few gatekeepers left. There are very few institutions. There are only about two institutions left in America that a majority of Americans have uh, high levels of confidence in. It's the army and like small business with police just on the bubble around 50%. Um, everything else is underwater. And so we have a sort of crisis in this country where the people who shout the loudest win the arguments because we don't have the kind of institutions that can keep that stuff in check. We have college administrators who are terrified of their students. Um, we have uh, you know, K through 12 parents who are terrified, you know, teachers who are terrified of like crossing anybody. And so we have a real leadership crisis in this country. And so a little populism is a fine thing. But when it's running the show, that's a real problem because it's, not, it's, it's, it's more interested in rage fulfillment than it is in actually finding solutions. And populism almost always, even though it means peopleism, it always ends up meaning the right peopleism, right? Because it's, it's, it's my people. People look like me, people think like me, not those other people. It's a very tribal way of thinking and it's inherently dangerous, and it needs to be at least kept in check. Not wiped out, but kept in check. Jonah, we've run out of time. Yep. We want to thank, thank you. you so much for your lecture. <laughs>